Well, that song uh, speaks of a God who speaks and of a people who listen. And so as we turn now to the scriptures, we want to be such a people. I want to uh, uh, point you to Psalm 2. We begin a new series this summer uh, as we consider the Psalms uh, throughout the next uh, uh, many weeks of summer. And as we do so, beholding Christ Jesus, our King and our Savior. This is uh, the psalmist writing in Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Please pray with me. Father, it is uh, with a genuine desire that we come eager to hear you speak. That we would know the blessing of what it is to take refuge in you, in your king, in your son. And as Pastor Trent comes now, Father, we pray you would give him uh, just a great freedom to preach by the power of your spirit. That he would speak the truth of the beauty of Christ, our triumphant king. That you would speak into the depths of our very beings by the power of your spirit. For the sake of Christ, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. It's always exciting for me when we start a new sermon series. Today we are starting a new series called Songs of the Savior King. And we're going to be looking each week at one of the Psalms, which come from the book of Psalms, and exploring how these particular Psalms prepare us for and enable us to better understand the person and work of Jesus, who is the Savior King. If you don't know anything about Covenant Church yet, we hope you come away today knowing that we are all about Jesus here. We believe that this whole scripture is about him. And so each and every week when you come here, you're going to hear about Jesus. And as you get to know him, you'll increasingly be really glad about that. If you're not really glad about that, come after this service. We'd love to talk with you and pray with you about this because we think when you discover who Jesus is, you're going to be as excited about him as we are. Now, a couple of things you need to understand as we get started in this new series. First of all, each of these psalms is actually a song. A lot of you probably know that. If you're newer to church or the study of the Bible, you might not know. But the psalms are actually written to be sung. Now, they're written to be sung in Hebrew. So if you just simply try to sing it in English, it's not going to come out exactly right. But these are songs. They're poetry. And so the reason why... We sing in worship, and the reason why the Psalter was written was so that God's people not only could know the truth intellectually, but so they could feel it as they sing. Our singing component of worship is not just to declare what we believe, but it's actually to shape your heart around the truth that we hold to in our head. We want you to not only have a mind that is filled with truth, but to have a heart that's set aflame. And music is one of the means God uses to cause us to feel the truth. 
It's like the difference between reading the lyrics of the Star Spangled Banner, which will have a certain effect, and actually singing it or hearing it sung by another that connects with a very different part of us. And so these are songs meant to be sung. Now, we're not actually this morning, for example, we didn't sing Psalm 2, but we're singing themes drawn from these Psalms. And actually every week we're singing the themes that come right out of the Scripture themselves. So you need to know as we go into this, this is meant to be sung truth. Secondly, don't get your hopes up. I'm not planning on doing any solos in this particular series. Just I need to say that now in case you're waiting on that. The second thing we got to say about these Psalms is they were written before the time of Jesus. So they are in a historical context. When we come to the study of the Scriptures, we always have to ask ourselves, what is the context in which this scripture came? It was written to particular people at a particular time in history. And if we're going to understand and interpret these psalms well, we need to understand what that context is. So broadly speaking, all of the psalms were written before the time of Jesus to the people of Israel. And they have immediate importance to the people who were singing them at first. But if we simply stop by interpreting them in their historical context, then we fall short of understanding the full message of these psalms. We also need to understand them in what we call their redemptive historical context. That means the whole story of the Bible is, is one grand story of God's salvation. And we happen to live in a later chapter than the people who first received these psalms. In fact, we live on the other side of the greatest event in all of redemptive history, which was the person and work of Jesus, and particularly his work on the cross. So when we read these psalms in their historical context, we don't simply leave it there, but we also read them now through the ministry and the person and work of Jesus. And so that's exactly what we're going to be doing as we look at these songs of the Savior King, seeing how these songs prepare us to understand and embrace and celebrate the work of Jesus. Amen? All right. Well, this morning we're looking at Psalm 2, and it is the most referred to psalm in all of the New Testament, which tells us a couple of things. One, it tells us that the early church understood the Psalms to continue to be the songs of God's people, that Christians share these songs as well as the Jews who originally received them. But the second thing it tells us is that the, uh, the message of this Psalm had immediate impact for the early church in the days in which they lived. And I think you'll see that it has an immediate uh, applicability for us as well. The theme of the psalm has to do with the question of power. The question of power. We know that this world is all about power, grasping for power. And the question the psalm is answering is, where exactly is the central seat of power in this world? Who's got it? If you paying close attention to the news today or even just not close attention to the news today, you might get the impression that the Kremlin is the seat of power for the world today. Alternatively, depending on your political perspective, you might say that, no, that's not right at all. The White House is the seat of power today. Almost nobody's saying that the Capitol is the seat of power today. But we have all these ideas about who holds the power. Others less politically inclined would say that really the, the, the ones pulling the strings, the ones that really hold the power in this world today are the titans of industry, the business leaders, Silicon Valley. That's where the power actually lies. They're the ones who are running the puppets who hold seemingly the power in the world today. Others might say that that's not where the power is at all. It's, it's, it's in Hollywood and in the hands of the cultural elite. They're the ones who are shaping this world and who are ultimately in control and in power of all things. And then there are still some who might say that power lies in the mob that can be gathered on social media in just a moment. That's where the power really lies. Look how fast they can bring down a business titan or a political leader when it's the power belongs to the people. Well, this psalm gives a definitive and different answer to who holds the power in this universe, who is ultimately sovereign, and to whom everyone must ultimately answer. The power belongs in the hands of God's anointed king. Let me sum up the theme of this, and we're actually going to then spend the rest of our time breaking down the theme. It's this. Here's the message of the psalm in one sentence. It is futile to resist the anointed king 
because God has established him, and therefore the wise will submit to him. It's futile to resist the anointed king, who we'll talk about who that is, because God has established him. Therefore, the application is, if you are wise, you won't resist him, you'll submit to him. Let's look at this in parts. First of all, it is futile to resist the anointed king. When we come to verse 1 of this Psalm 2, we read these words. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? That's the question. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? So the implication is the nations do rage and the peoples are plotting. We'll see ultimately that they're plotting against God and his anointed king. But the question is, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? That phrase, plot, word, that word plot, in Hebrew is the word that's often translated meditate. In Psalm 1, we read that the righteous person is the one who is meditating on God's law day and night. Here in Psalm 2, we read of another group of people who are also meditating day and night, but not on God's law and how they might bring their lives into submission to him and his king, but actually what they're meditating on day and night is how they might resist him. Haman, whom we just learned about in the book of Esther, is a picture of one who's plotting day and night about how he might resist God and his purposes in the world. And ultimately we see in the story of Esther the futility of plotting against God. And the reality is that's always the end for those who are resisting and plotting against the king. But the question is why? So let's look at a few different little subpoints here. The first is what's the reason for our resistance to the king, to the Lord's anointed? We see uh, a little answer in 2 and 3, verses 2 and 3. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying... Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. In their words, we hear the reason for the rebellion against the Lord and his anointed because they ultimately understand or they they feel that the Lord is constraining their freedom, that the Lord is taking them prisoner. He's taking them captive. Why do people rebel against the Lord's anointed and his king? I'll tell you why. Because we don't want a king. We especially don't want a king. We exist as a nation because we didn't want a king. We're democratic people. We don't like the idea that one person has the power and what he says goes. And so we by nature, and also I would say as a product of the very nation in which we've grown up and some of the values that we hold, we are a people who resist the idea of a sovereign king who has the right and the authority to tell us exactly what to do and to whom our only response should be, yes, your majesty. So we resist it. We say, let us cast off their bonds. Let us throw off their restraints. We don't want this king. You're sitting there and you're saying, wait, I don't think I've ever actually said that. That's not really me. Well, here's how we say it today. Who is this God? And what is this Bible that says marriage is between a man and a woman? Let's cast off his bonds. Let's throw them off of us. He's constraining us. That book is old and it's dated. Who is some God tells me who I can love and not love? Who is this God who says I have a responsibility to the poor? What does he know? Who is this God who tells me that that there are consequences for expressing my sexuality outside of the covenant bond of marriage. What does he know? This is so dated. I'm not going to be ruled by some ancient God in some Middle Eastern country. Who is this God who says I need to lay down my life for my wife? 
Or who's this God who says I need to submit to my husband? Or that I shouldn't be a greedy person? What is, who is this God? Let's cast off his restraints. You see, we want to be free, and we think freedom means casting off all restraint. But those who are wise know that freedom isn't casting off all restraint. Freedom is having the right constraints. And the right constraints are the ones that God has laid out for us in his word. He's shown us what is good. What is good? To do justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly with our God, to love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love our neighbor as ourselves. Those are some of the ways the Bible sums up what it means to live under the constraints of this king. To not do so is sin. James Montgomery Boyce, the lay pastor, says that, that sin is a repudiation of God's rule in favor of one's own will. Sin is a repudiation of God's will in favor of one's own will. We are saying, when we sin, we are saying, in effect, let's cast off his bonds. What does he know? Who is he that he can tell me how to live? Who is he that he thinks he knows what's good as compared to what I know? I'm going my way. That's sin. We don't want a king. We reject the king because we want to go our own way. And a king, by his very existence, says, there's one way, and it's my way. We, we, we don't, we chafe under that. What is exactly, who is exactly the object of our resistance? We see it in verse 2. The kings of the earth set themselves, the rulers take counsel together. Against who? Against the Lord and against his anointed. The Lord is the God who's revealed throughout the scriptures. He is the infinite, eternal, and unchangeable being who is perfect in his wisdom, his justice, his holiness, his goodness, his power, and his truth. That's who the Lord is. Who's his anointed? In Hebrew, the word is Mashiach. Messiah, that the rulers of this world take counsel against the Lord and against his Messiah. His Messiah. Well, what is the Messiah? This word Messiah, the Hebrew form of it, shows up in the Old Testament a number of times, and it's speaking about a, a, a person who is a, a Messiah, is a person who is anointed with oil. They have oil poured on them. And that oil is a sign, a symbol of the fact that this person, or many times objects that were to be in the temple or the tabernacle were also anointed, the oil sets them apart, the person or the object, from a normal use, and they are now for a holy use. Now, there were three particular groups of people who were anointed in the Old Testament, prophets, priests, and kings. They were anointed with oil and set apart by God no longer to live simply a normal, regular life in this world, but they were now to live specifically, called to live for God's purposes in this world. One Old Testament scholar says, he describes it this way, by reason of their anointing, these objects and persons are no longer ordinary, but now partake of the holy character of God. No longer can they function as ordinary objects or as private persons. Now they must always be used and act with reference to God and his purposes. So when we read through the scripture here and we hear that, that the, the rulers of the world are taking up arms against the Lord and his anointed, who does that refer to? Well, when the first people, the Israelites, were singing this song, the Lord's anointed referred to the king of Israel. David understood Saul to be the Lord's anointed. And he understood that that was a special position, that you don't mess with the Lord's anointed, even if he's crazy and messed up like Saul was. So throughout the story, you know, Saul is trying to kill David. If you're familiar with that story, he's trying to kill David. And David has opportunities to kill Saul, but he refuses to do so because he understands that to resist the Lord's anointed is to resist the Lord who anointed him. 
And he was not so foolish as to do that, even though it might have cost him his life. David also was the Lord's anointed. But as we read through the scripture and we read through the stories of the different kings of Israel and Judah, what we discover is that none of the kings of Israel and Judah seemed to live up to what it meant to be the Lord's anointed. And as we continue reading through the scriptures, we come into the New Testament and we meet a person who is obviously unique and he is called Jesus the Christ. Christ is the Greek word for Messiah, anointed one. The Bible identifies Jesus as the anointed one par excellence. He does what all of the other anointed ones throughout history failed to do. What does he do? He actually establishes the kingdom of God on earth. He is the anointed one who brings the reign of God to earth. As a result, the kings of this earth and the rulers and the authorities resisted Jesus with everything in them. He was the Lord's anointed, and so against him, the people of his day expressed their hatred for the Lord who appointed him. And that continued beyond the ministry of Jesus into the time of the early church. If you have your Bible, I want you to turn with me to Acts chapter 4. And I want you to turn there because all these verses actually aren't going to come up on the screen. But in Acts chapter 4, Jesus has already risen from the dead. He has commissioned his disciples to go and proclaim the good news of the kingdom to all creation and that he's the king. And he's ascended into heaven where he sits at the right hand of God and reigns. And he told his disciples to go out and proclaim this news, and they do. And as they go out and proclaim the lordship of Jesus and that he is the king, that he's the anointed, well, they get beat up and they get imprisoned. Peter and John particularly are thrown into jail, and in jail, the rulers and authorities say to them, do not speak about this Jesus. Don't go around saying that he's the king and that he's raised from the dead and that everybody's going to have to answer to him. We're the authorities. Don't do that. And so we read, picking up in Acts chapter 4, verse 23. When they were released from prison, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord! who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. They're seeing a fulfillment of the psalm we're looking at here. Continues in verse 27, For truly in this city, Jerusalem, there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel. <laughs> the people who are supposed to be God's people and the nations rejecting the king whom God anointed. To do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, O Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. They understand the persecution they were facing and the very death of Jesus itself to be the fulfillment of Psalm 2, the nations raging against the Lord and his anointed. And what is their answer to the nations raging against the kingship of Jesus? To preach. The answer to the nation's resistance to Jesus as king is to go on preaching about Jesus as king with all boldness. No matter what it might cost them. The Spirit of God filled them to continue to proclaim, regardless of what the world's rulers were saying, 
There is one king. There is one power in this universe to which every other power and authority must ultimately answer, and that is Jesus, who was raised from the dead and sits enthroned in heaven. So, brothers and sisters, the immediate application here, of course, for us is this too is our call to proclaim this message of Jesus. And I believe that when we, the church, collectively declare the truth of what the Scripture says about who Jesus is and his place in this world, the rulers and authorities will not be pleased. It makes me wonder if somehow we have begun to water down the fullness of the message about Jesus' lordship and the fact that everyone will ultimately answer to him. Why are the powers and authorities not more resistant to the church of Jesus? Something for us to consider. The last thing we see here with regards to this is the futility of our resistance against this anointed king. It is futile to resist him. How does the king respond to the, uh, well, why is it futile to resist the king? It's futile. It's not only futile, it's foolish. Why is it foolish to resist the king whom God's anointed? It's foolish because this king is really good. He's actually really good. When you read about how he's described in the Bible, he's actually everything we would ever want in a person, and certainly everything we'd ever want in a person who has ultimate authority. He is righteous. He's just. He's merciful. He's compassionate. He's kind. He's the only person who should ever be trusted with ultimate authority. He's the only one whom absolute power will never corrupt. And those who discover that Jesus in the scripture discover he is one to whom we can entrust ourselves and submit to entirely and fully and completely. To not submit to him is to misunderstand what he's really like. It's also foolish to resist this king because it is ultimately futile. He will be king. Every knee will bow before him. There will be, there is no question about how this story ends. Every ruler, every authority, every power, every person from the greatest to the least will bow the knee to Jesus. Those who are wise will do so today and not wait until he returns. All right, it's futile to resist the anointed king. Why? Our second point in today is that it's futile to resist him because the Lord has established his anointed king. Jesus didn't randomly arise to be the king of the universe. This was God's idea. This is God's plan working itself out. We'll see how that happens here in a moment. Looking at verse 4, how does God respond to the peoples and the nations and all the world's rulers resisting him? We read in verse 4, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. This is the only place in the Bible that speaks about God laughing. And it's not good laughter. This is the kind of laughter when... You know, some measly power begins to threaten some great world power. Like, really? Like when West Virginia fans trash talk Alabama or something like that. You know, it's that kind of thing. Just, they just laugh. They're mocking. They're scoffing. Who do, you, who do you think you are? God sits in heaven and he laughs and says, what are, you, are you kidding? It's the story of Babel. God sits in the heavens and laughs, and in a moment, he shuts down the whole work, just changes their language. They can't talk to each other anymore. He just laughs, but the laughter very quickly turns to wrath and judgment. Verse 5 and 6, then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. In the face of all the world's rulers and leaders and individuals who are claiming autonomy and authority over their own lives, God says, no, no, no. I've chosen my king. I've put him in the place of power, the position of authority and glory and honor, and you will ultimately submit to him. Now, in its historical context, we're talking about 
Israel and the king of Israel. But as you read the story of Israel, none of the kings of Israel ever ultimately fulfilled what God's intention for them was. Why did God want to appoint an earthly king to rule over the nations? So that that king who was supposed to be shaped after God's own heart would rule and bring justice and mercy and righteousness to the ends of the earth. That's what the kings of Israel and the people of Israel were supposed to do. They were supposed to be undoing the works of the fall. But we discover time and time again that the kings of Israel and the people of Israel were products of the fall themselves. They never actually could accomplish this. And so what does God do? He comes and he fulfills what all of the former kings and all of his people failed to do. He comes and he brings righteousness and justice and establishes a kingdom. Verse 7. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. This verse is picked up a number of different times in the New Testament. But it's essentially God speaking to his anointed, saying, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. This was, uh, many people think this was a a psalm that was used in the coronation of the kings of Israel, that it was, um, that that the kings of Israel were understood to be sons of God in the sense of belonging to him in a special kind of a way, unique way. Um, But the ultimate fulfillment of this, we know, comes through the person and ministry of Jesus. And it is the fulfillment of an earlier covenant God made called the Davidic Covenant, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14. God makes this promise to David. Here's what he says. That one of David's descendants, or that David or his descendants, shall build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Now we know that none of David's immediate children fulfilled this promise. Solomon didn't do it. None of the others who came after did it. But when Jesus steps onto the scene, we're told very importantly that he is a son of David and that he is the fulfillment of this promise that God made to David that one of his descendants would reign on a throne that lasts forever. Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise to David. Now, when is this day, this today, when God says today I have begotten you. When is this day? Well, the other New Testament authors, Paul in particular, helps us understand when this day of Jesus uh, being revealed to be the fulfillment of the promise to David actually happened. It's in Acts chapter 13. Paul is speaking to some Jews, explaining to them their scriptures in light of Christ, and this is what he says. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers... This is particularly with regard to that Davidic promise we saw a moment ago. That what God has promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. As also it was written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. It is through the resurrection of Jesus that the Apostle Paul sees the promise to David being fulfilled. That through Christ's resurrection, a forever king has been established, who will rule, who will bring the righteousness, the justice, and the peace to all of the earth that was promised to David. He says it again in another place in Romans chapter 1. He says that this promise concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh, we're talking about Jesus here, and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus' resurrection is the day in which it is revealed that he is the anointed king who is to reign forever. Now, God has given this king some particular promises, and we read about them here also in Psalm 2. Look with me in verse 8. God says to his king, Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. God promises to Jesus, his anointed, I will give you a kingdom that extends as far as the globe. Every nation, every tongue, every language, every tribe will 
pay homage to you. We know that none of the other kings of Israel fulfilled this. This is fulfilled by Jesus. Now, when Jesus is about to go into heaven after his resurrection, he says to his disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. In other words, I'm the rightful king over everyone and everywhere. Therefore, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus has risen. He has all authority. He is the rightful king over everybody. Therefore, our job as his people who have submitted the knee to him is to go to the farthest nations and across the street and declare the good news that this broken world will not be broken forever. That the sin and the craziness that goes on here will not go on forever. That the things that are messed up about you will not go on forever. But God has set his king on Zion, his holy hill. And he's going to bring righteousness and justice and peace. And it's good news. That the Kremlin doesn't have ultimate power, that the White House doesn't have ultimate power, that the Supreme Court doesn't have power, that Hollywood doesn't have ultimate power, but there's a king. And all of these powers will give an answer to him, and so will you. This is the missionary task of the church to go and proclaim the good news that there's an anointed king who has actually put an end and who is putting an end to all of the evil in the world by taking it in himself upon the cross. He is not just the king, but he is the savior king. The way he can bring about your salvation and justice and righteousness in this world without destroying you is that he actually came as a human and he took your punishment. He took the judgment your sins deserve in, in your place. He died and he rose again. And through his death now he's reconciling, bringing together everything that sin has separated it's futile to resist the anointed king because God has established him himself. And here's the application. Therefore, the wise will submit to the anointed king. Verses 10 to 12 lay it out for us like this. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. It's pretty straightforward what we're supposed to do with this knowledge about Jesus being the king. We're called to submit to him. What does it mean and what does it look like practically to do this? Well, let me break it down for you in three parts. First of all, submitting to the king means that we're called to serve him. He is, after all, a king. And when you have a king, your one job in the world is to serve him. Whatever it costs, whatever it takes, whatever it means, if you have a king, your life exists for him. And the Bible says we have such a king. Now, with a king, there aren't negotiations. You're a subject of this king. And he has said what he wants of you. He says things like, don't lie to each other. Don't murder. Don't be a fornicator. Don't be consumed with greed. Don't worship other gods. Don't neglect poor or mock them. He says these kinds of things to us. And the proper response to the king is to say, yes, your majesty. And if the king says, I want you to go to the ends of the earth and tell them about me, our answer is, yes, your majesty. If he says, I want you to go across the street and I want you to speak to them about me, our answer to him is, yes, your majesty. 
If he says, I want you to go to the Muslims, I want you to die there proclaiming the gospel, the answer is, yes, your majesty, I only regret that I have one life to give in your service. We've forgotten that Jesus is a king. And we, and we say things like, yeah, Jesus, I know you said, I know what you said about marriage and how it should work, but don't you know we voted? We said it's okay. He's a king. Do you treat him as a consultant? I read what your word says, Jesus, about not lying, not stealing, not, not being fornicator, not, not uh, worshiping other gods. And, and I like what you said here and here, but this thing, I don't like that so much. I'm just going to leave that on the table. I'm going to take this part. Thanks for the great advice. This is really good. You need to catch up with the times over here, but <laughs> is he a consultant to you? When you read his word, you say, this is good, this not so much. Brothers and sisters, he's a king. He's either a king or he's not, but he's most definitely not a consultant. So don't treat his word as simply advice that you can take or leave depending as it suits you. He's either your king and you say, yes, your majesty. It's my pleasure to serve you, your majesty. Whatever it takes, your majesty. My life is only for you. My life has meaning only in, in, in relation to you. Or is not. Submission to him means serving him. Secondly, submission means embracing him. The text says to kiss the son. It's a, it's a word, of course, it's a way that, that, that homage used to be paid. You'd kiss the, the hand of the king and the ring, and, and in some ways it's a formality, but not for us. To kiss the son is to embrace him. Not simply to, to grit our teeth and say, yes, your majesty, but it's to be so moved with affection for him that it's actually our pleasure to serve him. It's our great joy to obey him. Now, how does that happen? How do we get to a place where we actually desire and love to sacrifice for him? That happens only as the truth of the gospel gets down deep in your heart and actually shapes your thinking and your heart. When you understand that this king who has every right to demand everything of you and then at the end to give you death and hell, stepped off of his throne and came and he, and he lived a perfect life on your behalf. And he set aside his crown to take up a cross to die for your sins so that you could have eternal life. When you understand the sacrifice he's made so that you could not only be his subject, but so that you could reign with him forever, then, then as that truth gets down into your heart, then suddenly it, sacrifices become less like sacrifices and more like love, more like the pleasure of doing something for someone whom I love who I owe my life to. It's my joy to serve him. Embrace him. Let your heart be enraptured with this king who's loved you and gave himself up for you. Finally, submission to this king entails taking refuge in him. It says, blessed are those who take refuge in him. Throughout the scriptures, God is portrayed as a shield through, behind which we hide. He's, he's portrayed as a rock in which we take shelter. He's portrayed as a mother hen who, who shelters us under his wings. The scripture invites us to find a refuge, a safe place, a hiding place in him. What, what, what most of the world is doing and what we're all doing before we come to know Christ is that we are seeking refuge from him. We're trying to hide from him. But listen, when Jesus comes again, as one commentator has said, there will be no refuge from him. There's only refuge in him. So today he invites all of you to take refuge in him. He will shelter you from the wrath and the judgment which is coming upon this world by which righteousness and justice will be established. If you will take refuge in his son Jesus, if you will cling to the cross, its shelter, its protection from the wrath of God which is coming. 
kiss the son, embrace him, submit to him, serve him. Therein you will find joy, the peace, and the satisfaction that your heart has been looking for away from him. You'll find it in him. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you for our Lord Jesus, who has given his all for us, that we might have life in his name and life eternal. I pray, Lord, for those who have not yet experienced Jesus as the benevolent king, that this morning they might see him as one who wills their good and their salvation, and who has purchased it with his own blood, and that he's not one to run from, but one to run to. May we each run to you this morning, Lord, and may we rededicate ourselves to living with you as king, the sovereign, whom we are called to serve, to embrace, and to hide ourselves in. Make these truths resonate beyond our ears, Lord, and our hearts, that it might shape our lives from here forth. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.